We are looking at the minor prophets, and we're still in the book of Amos. And this book of Amos is a book that we know about, the words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa. That means he's in the southern kingdom of Judah. At this point, Israel's had a civil war, and so they've got a north and a south. He's in the south, and he sees this concerning the north. Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah the south, Jeroboam, king of jo- or son of Joash, king of Israel in the north. So that's what it is, and we've been going through those passages for a few weeks now. We'll continue next Sunday. Pastor David Fleming will be back next Sunday to be teaching some passages out of Amos that are some of his favorites. But today we're going to be looking at some passages that are some of mine. And so what I've done is I've grouped these passages conveniently into three different ideas. I want to talk about some passages where the context is very important. And then I want to talk about some passages that talk about lifestyle that, as Coach said, is so important to us, speaks to us today. And then the third thing I want to talk about are some surprising passages, including one that Dale Hearn has uh, uh, asked me to be sure and include. So we will try to do all of that together. We're going to start with the, whoops, that should say not passages then, that should say context. And that comes when you mess up. And so we're going to fix that mess up because I just, I can't handle it. Control, save, control, return. So we're going to start with passages where the context is very important. And the first one that we're going to look at, ah, there we go. First one we're going to look at is from Amos chapter 3, verse 1. Now, here's the passage. Hear this word that Yahweh, the Lord, has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. I love this passage. Now, our daughter Gracie lives in Boca Raton, Florida, and in her community, there are a lot of Jewish families, and she was talking to one of her Jewish neighbors recently, and the Jewish neighbor said to to Gracie, do you speak Yiddish? And Gracie said, no, but I've seen Fiddler on the Roof. (laughs) And I thought that was a great answer because Fiddler on the Roof actually has a lot of Yiddish in it. Um, Okay, now my remote control is not working. So this uh, this is the day of errors and frustrations. Hold on, we're going to fix this wagon. Just remember, we're on Fiddler on the Roof. There. So one of my favorite scenes in Fiddler on the Roof involves the rabbi. Now, our dad was involved in community theater, and uh, uh, Lubbock had basically a Broadway-quality production A fiddler on the roof, uh, and uh, dad played the rabbi. And so I love this line also because I got to hear my dad give this line. But the rabbi is asked in the midst of a great crowd, Rabbi, Rabbi, is there a proper blessing for the tsar? Now the tsar was nothing but trouble to to, to, to the Jews. And so the the rabbi stumbles and tries to think, and of course there's got to be a proper blessing. There's a blessing for everyone. And so the rabbi says, of course, may God bless and keep the star far away from us. (laughs) And I like that. There is a proper blessing. There is a way for God to speak over all of us. The question is, how's he going to do it? See, go back to this passage. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. And you've got the ale, alechem, actually, alechem is against you, and then you've got the al here. But I've highlighted these two letters the ayan and the lamed. 
the ion is this one that looks like uh, hook'em horns, kind of. And uh, this is the L for loser. Um, just something you can remember it by. And uh, this, this word al in Hebrew covers a lot of territory. So when you put this word, which is um, in front of them here, when you put this word, it can mean over, it can mean on, it can mean above, it can mean with regard to, it can mean against, and you figure out how to translate it by the context. See, Hebrew's got about 6,000 functioning words in it. Biblical Hebrew, I should say. Biblical Hebrew has about six to 7,000 functioning vocabulary words. The average English speaker with a high school education has at their resource an understanding of around 50,000 words. Which means that every Hebrew word, if it were proportional... Every Hebrew word's got probably eight or nine English words it's got a cover for. And so when you're translating, a lot of the work that you're doing is trying to figure out which of the eight or nine English words should be used here because our language is so nuanced. And, and, and the problem with it is, is sometimes the Hebrew word covers a lot more territory on purpose. And when we have to choose one of our minute English words that are so specific, we lose the larger context of the Hebrew. So here is one of those circumstances. Hear this word, the Lord has spoken against you, but that could also be translated over you. It could be translated on you or above you or with regard to you, O people of Israel against the whole family that I brought up. Now, why do the translators choose against here? Because in the context, God's not speaking positive over these people. He's bringing judgment. The word that he is speaking over them is not one of positive blessings. It's one of condemnation and judgment. Now, we live in a day and an era where we want to only point out the good aspects of God. And we'll talk about that. But there really is such a thing as God's judgment. There are things that God rightly disapproves of. And the question becomes the context of your life and mine. And when we read this passage and we're looking at it with the Hebrew all in there, I ask the question, how's God going to speak over us? Is that all going to be against? Or is it going to be a blessing? Is it going to be over? Where is he going to speak in our life? And that's something that's fair for all of us to ask if we were to take that verse and think about it in terms of what is God? Because God's going to speak into everyone's life. God does not ignore anyone. So the question becomes, how do we hear the voice of the Lord and what is the voice of the Lord? And we'll get to that more as we look at more of these passages. But that's your setup for today. So with that, let's roll forward about five verses and look at Amos 3, verse 6. Now, I'm going to isolate this verse for you. I want you to look at it because this is one of the most important verses in the New Testament, I mean in the, in the Bible, for what we're talking about today. Here's the passage. Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? I think I probably first came across this passage when I was translating um, the minor prophets in Hebrew class. And I had to translate it. Um, but the biggest memory I had, and, and I don't really remember it, honestly. I, I, I translated Amos, so I mean, the, 
Professor Miller would not let us skip over verse 6. I'm sure I got it, okay? But, but what my big memory of this passage is, is with a buddy of mine, dear friend of mine who's a preacher, not at this church. He's a preacher. And I want to take you back. I want to take you back. There we go. Whoops, not there, just to there. To August 2005. I think it was August 29th. Katrina is coming and slams into New Orleans. And I mean slams. New Orleans, by the time it's over, 80% of the city is underwater. 1,800 people dead. So much of the population displaced. The costliest disaster in the history of the United States. And my buddy points to this passage when we're having a debate because he preached a sermon that said the reason the hurricane Katrina slammed into New Orleans is because New Orleans had so much sin in the city and it was God's judgment. And I took issue with him. I said, you know, I, I'm not saying that God doesn't use things, and I'm not saying that God doesn't have judgment, and I'm not saying that God doesn't work through nature, but you cannot make that assessment. That is not yours to make unless you're willing to be set up like all prophets, which means if you're prophesying incorrectly and you prove to be a false prophet, prophet you're supposed to be stoned. If you're not willing to put your life on the line, don't stand up and say those kinds of things and don't blame God for that. He said, but look at all of the sinners. I said, the sinners are the ones who had all the money and they left. <laughs> the ones that got slammed in this weren't the sinners. You think the casino owners are sitting around going, hey, here comes the hurricane. I think I'll keep my jet in the hangar and uh, see if it slams my casino. No, they're in their private planes. They're gone, baby. I, and, and he said, but, and he uses the Amos passage. Now, I, I, I don't know if he preached the same after Hurricane Ian came ashore in Florida a few weeks ago. I suspect not. But I want to tell you that this passage to support that view, and if you've said it before, I love you to death. But in my opinion, that's taking this passage out of context. And so what we need to do is look at the context. By the way, do you know a classic scripture that is taken out of context the same way in the New Testament? I won't know where it is. One of you does. There's the story of, of Jesus has healed someone, and the chief priests and the, the, the Sanhedrin, the council, the rulers have got the person there, and they're grilling the person. And, and the person's reply is, hey, all I, I don't know who he is. I'm not saying he's Messiah. I'm not saying anything else. I'm just saying he prayed to God, and I got healed. And their reply is, hey, listen, we know God doesn't listen to the prayers of sinners. Now, I had someone use that passage against me one time. Hey, God doesn't listen to the prayers of sinners. I said, yes, he does. No, look, it says here in the Bible, in this verse, God doesn't listen to prayers of sinners. I said, yeah, it says that. And what it says is, is that the chief priest was saying it. The chief priest was also saying Jesus wasn't Messiah. Do you want to quote him on that? you got to take it into context. The chief priest's theology was all messed up or he wouldn't have killed Jesus or had a role in it. Context is extremely important. So here's the context. Do two walk together unless they've agreed to meet? Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Does a young lion cry out from his den if he's taken nothing? Does a bird fall in a snare on the earth when there's no snare? 
does a snare spring up from the ground when it's got nothing landing on it? Is a trumpet blown in a city and the people aren't afraid? Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? For the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. The lion has roared, who won't fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? Now that may sound like a bunch of gobbledygook to you. So let's look at it for a moment carefully. And let's understand this context. A simile, if you remember high school English, a simile is when you compare things. You use an illustration to make another point. This is a succession of similes. I drew this yesterday. Yeah, you are so going to be blown away. Look at this. A succession of similes. Now, this is some of my best artwork right here. <laughs> Two walk together because they've agreed to meet. I could have probably done that live right here and just drawn that right in front of you with speed and accuracy. But I went ahead and drew it ahead of time because I knew after that I was going to have to draw a lion. <laughs> Brent was looking at this before class. He said, did you draw that? I said, yep. He said, that's pretty good. I said, yep. Do you know how? I got a YouTube clip. The easiest way to draw a lion. And it's a little two-minute clip. I spent 45 minutes watching it and re-watching it, drawing line by line, trying to get the lion right. So I did not try to draw this in front of you because I would have had no chance. But the first simile is, do two walk together unless they've agreed to meet? Does a lion roar unless he's got prey? Is a bird caught because of the trap, yes. Is the chauffeur, the horn, blown without everybody being in fear? Of course not, because that's what it was. That was the alarm. Can a disaster come over a city? <laughs> they didn't have a YouTube uh, draw, how to draw a disaster over a city, so you're just going to have to think that I went to modern art at that point. Can disaster befall a city unless God decrees it of sorts? Now, these similes have a meaning, and they are all to be understood together. This is one big passage. So let's look at it together for a moment. The two walking together because they've agreed to meet, that is God and Amos. God has spoken. And Amos the prophet has agreed to be his mouthpiece. So what Amos is saying comes from him meeting with God. A contemporary of Amos was Jonah. That's an example of two not agreeing to meet. At least not for the first several chapters. Can a lion roar without its prey? The lion is God. The lion is God, and God, just like a lion roars when it has its prey, so the voice of God goes out when he's got a message to say. The bird caught in a trap is Israel. Now you may be saying, where are you getting this from? This sounds goofy. It's in the passage, and I'll show you. Let me explain it, and then we'll go back and see where it is in the passage that we just didn't notice because it's so foreign to our way of thinking. The bird caught in a trap is Israel. Israel has lived a life that is one that's destined to make them dinner at the table for other people. The chauffeur horn that's blown 
And that's the prophet. That's Amos. Amos is declaring what's going to happen. And the disaster over the city is the coming judgment or doom on Israel. And it's the completion of the metaphor. So if we go back to the passage and look at it. The Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. So now we're backing back away from the simile. So the Lord does nothing, disaster over the city, without saying it to his prophets. And then you continue to back away. The lion has roared, who's not going to fear. God has spoken, who can but prophesy. The judgment's coming. The prophet has said it. The lion has roared. The prey he has. Who can but prophesy? And it walks back, the passage walks back, the explanation. Which takes me to where we started this. We started this with this passage. Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? That's not a statement for all time where anytime there's a natural disaster, you know God's the responsible party. That takes it out of context. Does that mean God can't use natural disasters? Of course he can. But don't ever be so presumptuous as to say that you are the prophet who is proclaiming that this is the hand of God and you blame God for the misery that a lot of people endure when the real answer for many times is we live in a fallen world that is busted. And this busted, fallen world affects people. And God charges you and me not with sitting in the back in judgment saying, well, it's your own fault. If you hadn't been so sinful, God wouldn't have done it to you. Instead, God calls us to be in a position of ministering and trying to make the best of a bad situation. To show His love, to show His compassion, to show His mercy. We can always be called on to do that. I love this church's reaction to natural disasters. I love the way we go out and help people muck out their homes. You know, it was not long after Katrina that the hurricane hit Houston. Did you get affected by the hurricane? If you did, that hit Houston, raise your hand, please. Okay, y'all aren't just, God didn't do that because he's just so fed up with your sin. So we've just got to be careful. Now, I'm not sure that that passage changes your life much, but it fixes a scripture that's one of my pet peeves. So there. Now, let's go to lifestyle. These will be more life-changing perhaps. The next passage I want to look at continues in Amos, and now we're going past verse 8. We're going to go to verse 9 and verse 10. Here's what you've got. Proclaim to the strongholds in Ashdod and to the strongholds in the land of Egypt... And say, hey, you guys get together, come together on the mountains of Samaria. Samaria is another name for the northern kingdom of Israel. The disobedient kingdom. You guys come get on the mountains, get a really good seat and watch what all's about to come down. Watch the oppressed in her midst. They don't know how to do right, declares the Lord. I, this is an interesting deal. He's saying, hey, you foreign con countries, Ashdod, Egypt, enemies of Israel, you guys come get on their mountains so you've got a great seat to see what's going to happen because they're not doing right and they're about to get judged. I don't know. Do we have any literature majors out there? Anybody that did like literature as a major? 
are just a bunch of engineers. I don't see one English major in the entire, oh, we got one? Oh, good. Well, welcome. I don't know if you've ever heard of this fellow or not. Anthony Trollope was a Victorian writer and fiction writer in England. And uh, during the Victorian era, he wrote a series of books that dealt with uh, Barset. They're called the Barset Shire novels, and they've got these characters. And the last one he wrote was in 1867, The Last Chronicle of Barset. And it's really, a, 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 I, I found it a fun read. Um, admittedly, I'm a nerd. Uh, but I still found it a fun read. And uh, uh, in it, he, he's got these characters, and these characters have great storylines going with it, but he'll comment and give social commentary along the way, which I find very interesting to read about. So, for example, he's going to talk about someone who's about to ask uh, to borrow some money. And uh, uh, Adolphus Crosby is going to borrow money from Mr. Butterwell. And before Adolphus asks to borrow the money, and the narrative, the storyline unfolds, Anthony Trollope, as the narrator, starts talking about all the different ways you could ask someone to borrow money. He says, one is slowly and deliberately. Where you start right here, and you just slowly work your way in, to asking to borrow money. Now, some of you might have had kids in college. Heavens, some of you might have kids that aren't in college who sometimes need to borrow money. There's the slow and deliberate approach where they just kind of work into it with you. Then there's the second approach, and this is the piteous approach where have pity on me. I need this. And the piteous approach, he says, can be divided into two. They can tell you a bunch of lies to get your pity and get you to loan them the money. Or they can actually tell you the truth and get you to loan them the money. And he goes through and he's got lots of other ways of people asked to borrow money. And he sets all this out. It's really a fascinating read. So anyway, Adolphus Crosby wants to borrow 500 pounds. Now that's Victorian English. And um, so that'd be about $75,000 today. Hefty sum. And when he does it, Mr. Butterwell says, what on earth do you need that much seventy five grand for? And then you get this line. Adolphus Crosby says, there's nothing I think so bad as washing one's dirty linen in public. It's the first expression I can find of what's probably been around for a long time, but, but it's the first one in literature that I can find of don't air your dirty laundry. You know, some things you are best kept to yourself or to your small family. You don't want to just tell, you know, in other words, you want to know why I need the money, I'm going to tell you, but I hate doing it because there's just nothing worse than airing your dirty laundry washing your dirty linen in public, and he proceeds to do it. Now, here's the reason this story comes to my mind. Proclaim to the strongholds in Ashdod, to the strongholds in the land of Egypt, and say, hey, come watch us air out our dirty laundry, because my people don't know how to do right, and the world's about to see that, because judgment is coming. I'm going to clean house, and they're not going to be able to hide it anymore. And it's an interesting comment on sin, because we as people have a tendency to think that we can just hide our sin and not deal with it. There's a song that came out... Uh, Becky and I were trying to place the time of it. It's been a long time. I don't remember when it came out. Uh, I should have looked it up. But I've got the song for you. It's by a fellow named Randy Stonehill. And uh, it's on his album, The Lazarus Heart. And the song is worth listening to. 
It's about three minutes long. Will you all listen to it with me? I'll put the lyrics up here. See if this works. I have a secret I can't tell And I've learned to conceal it well kind of a, a haunting melody to go with very haunting lyrics. You know, biblically, if I can use a modern simile, sin is like cancer. It's cells gone amok. And, and God will not ignore cancer. He will not ignore sin. And, and as people, if we think God doesn't know what's under our carpet, we are deluded of all people. If we think God doesn't know the skeletons in our closet, we are deluded beyond all people. God is acutely aware, and God wants to clean out under the rug, and he wants to clean out our closet. And if you've got those areas in your life 
that you're hoping and praying no one ever finds out about, might I suggest to you, before your dirty linen is aired in public by a God who won't ignore the cancer, might I suggest to you that you first begin by going to the Lord and admitting what you've hidden under the rug. Admit what you put in the closet. Confess your sins to him and he is faithful to forgive you. I have a buddy whose daughter has just really, really, really gone through with it. She has, she has destroyed so much of her life. And she has, has taken the treasure of, of even the gospel that was invested in her and has, has made it a, a, a just has really messed up. And for several years, my buddies had to show tough love to this child. Can't reinforce that lifestyle. Doesn't even know the full depths of it. But what he knows is just ripped him apart. And that daughter has finally come to try and reestablish a relationship with my buddy. And he was going to be having dinner with her for the first time in years. And she wants forgiveness and my buddy said to her said to me he said you know I'm going to tell her that I forgive her but I'm not going to forget what she did and I said to my buddy I said now wait a minute you're called to model our God and our God makes it a point of saying not only does he forgive us when we confess our sins but he forgets them he throws them as far away as the east is from the west and you're called to model that forgiveness because you're the closest thing to God the Father she's going to know right now in her life. So you don't say to her, all right, I'm going to forgive you, but I'm not forgetting. You can say, I'm going to forgive you because your real sin is against God and God forgives you and he loves you and I love you. And I'm excited that we're going to take the time to rebuild the trust because that will take time. But there's a difference there. And, and, and I, I urge you to take your sins, to take what you've hidden under the rug and take it to the Lord and experience His forgiveness. He will clean out under your rug for you. He will remove that. But it takes you taking it to the Lord and confessing it and being honest with Him about it. Okay. That's lifestyle there. Let's go to another lifestyle. Amos 3, 13 through 14. Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, declares the Lord God, the God of hosts, that on the day I punish Israel for his transgressions, I'll punish the altars of Bethel. That's where they built uh, the... Golden cows, uh, not the ones right out of Egypt, but they'd redone it. Um, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. Now, I got two pictures here because I got two stories. The picture on your left is our grandson, John Henry. Now, John Henry in October turned three. Becky and I got to come in for his birthday party. And our daughter, Gracie, gave us a list of to-dos. Becky, we had to get the balloons. We had to get, I don't remember what all. We got the balloons. We got, did we get the cake? We got the cake. We got the balloons. We had a list. And I don't remember what all it was because Gracie gave the list to Becky and I was really just driving. <laughs> Becky was like, now we got to go over there. Now I got to go over there. And I'm doing good. I can drive and I can carry. But Becky had it all organized, where we go, when we go, what we get, and it's all going to work out, and we're going to be at the party on time with balloons, cake, or cupcakes, or whatever it was. I mean, we're, we're going to have it all ready to go. We are there. Now, my, I have a friend who was facing, at the same time, some medical issues. 
that had really surprised him. And he was scared to death. And he didn't know what to do. And so he had to go work through these issues with doctors. And he was covering it in prayer. Lord, I need you. I don't know what to do. I'm at a loss. Now, I want you to compare these two stories for a minute. See, Becky and I, to do what we needed to do for John Henry's birthday party, were actually trusting in a lot of different people. We were trusting that the car would work. We were trusting that the plastic payment method would work. We were trusting that the balloon people will have had the balloons done on time. That the cupcake or cake people will have made the, it was a cake, would have made the cake on time. That the cake would have spelled happy birthday instead of, you know, happy bar mitzvah. We were trusting in a lot of things, but honestly, we were so caught up in the joy of getting to do this and the excitement of the birthday party that if you had asked me, what are you trusting in? I said, nothing, we got this. We were trusting in things. It just wasn't too conscious because it's stuff we trust in all the time, so we take it for granted. Meanwhile, something unusual happens that doesn't happen all the time. You don't take it for granted. You panic or you worry or you get concerned enough to bathe it in prayer. I, I, I want to live over here. I, I, I don't want to just lean on the fact that we've got a car that works, that we have directions, that we have the money to, to buy what we need to buy, that we've got the opportunity to get to the park. I don't want to just lean on the things of this world to live. I want to lean on God providing through the things of this world. It's a difference in focus. And so it's a, just a question, what are we leaning on? See, Israel was leaning. This passage is one where Israel's leaning on the religion that they grew up with, what they understood. They've got the golden calf at Bethel. They've got the horns of the altar. They think it's all good. And God says, I'm chopping all of that down. You shouldn't be living and relying on that. You need to be living and relying on me. And so I hope we get to go back and work on John Henry's fourth birthday. But as we do so, I hope that I'm a little bit more cognizant of thanking God and relying on God even for the things that are ordinary in our day-to-day. -day. It's a question of focus and what we lean on. All right, we've got a few more minutes. I would like to talk about some surprising passages, and hopefully we'll get at least two of these done. The first one is Amos 4, verse 1. Look at this. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan. Spoiler alert. He's talking about Israelite women here, not real cows. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountains of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring that so we might drink. I'm reminded of my friend, Dr. Bob. He says he was sitting down to watch the cowboy game. And he said to his wife, Kelly, Kelly, could you bring me a glass of iced tea before it starts? She says, sure. She brings him a glass of iced tea. He drinks it, rattles the ice cubes in the glass, says, hey, Kelly, can you get me some more iced tea before it starts? She gets up, gets him some more iced tea. He drinks it, starts rattling the ice cubes, says, hey, Kelly, can you get me some more iced tea before it starts? She says, get it yourself. He says, well, it started. Um, this, this is the flip side. <laughs> this, this is the flip side. The women are telling their husbands, bring me some more iced tea. He's basically said that these women are a bunch of fat cows who are feasting on the land, oppressing the poor, crushing the needy, and bossing their husbands around. And he's got a word for them. Hint, not a good word. 
Now, these aren't little nice cows of Bashan like the Chick-fil-A ad, okay? And you shouldn't take this as, well, I thought sticks and stones may break my bones, but word, you know, gee, God has devolved the prophet into a third grade taunt, oh, you cow of Bashan. No, there really were cows of Bashan that were well known for, for having the best pasture land and getting to eat and being the fattest cows around. So he's not just calling them a fat cow in our modern sense. He's saying, that's what you are. You're just sitting around, standing around eating. You'll oppress the poor for your food. You'll nudge them out of the pasture so you can eat everything you've got. And I did get an email from a dear friend of mine in this class who said, sometimes in this I have a tendency to say too much about the poor and I don't give the other side of the coin that, that the unpoor to be treated fairly as well. Yeah, that's true, but this is what Amos is saying. He's not saying, hey, poor people, you're eating more than your share. Let the rich people eat. He's talking about the fact that they're abusing it and they're not giving thought to it. He's talking about why we pass the envelope around so that we who are going to be feasting on Thanksgiving can be cognizant of the people who for Thanksgiving it means they don't have a chance to eat anything. And so we're going to go share a meal with them. And that's what he's saying here. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan who are on the mountain of Samaria. You are sitting there and you're eating all of this food. You better be mindful of the people who don't have any. It's the reason if you go to our church website, you see that we've got a food pantry where we give away thousands of meals to our community. And when we support this church, some of our support goes there. And we keep that stocked, and it's not just supporting the church. You'll find a list of things that are needed there, groceries that are needed there. And if you'll download that list every time you go to the grocery store, even if you can't only afford to add a few cans to what you've got, and you drop it off, you're demonstrating a spirit, a lifestyle change that's really good on a surprising verse. I've got to get to one more, Amos 4, 6. I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities. And lack of bread in all your places, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. Sarah, our daughter, was three years old, maybe four, when she decided she could sing all the time. And all of her songs had very important words. And we were driving, and she started singing, I love my mommy. I love my daddy. I love my brothers. I love my sisters. I love God. I love Jesus. But I don't love the dentist. <laughs> when God says, I will give them cleanness of teeth, he's not talking about his role as a dental hygienist. This passage says something else. <laughs> I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places. This is Hebrew parallelism. Cleanness of teeth is parallel to lack of bread. In other words, I starved you. I starved you trying to get your attention. So cleanness of teeth means you didn't have any food in your teeth because you didn't have any food to eat. I tried to get your attention. God doesn't inflict pain without a purpose. I tried to get your attention. And by the way, in that sense, God may be a dentist. Um, but this plugs in real closely with the following verses right after it, 9 through 12. I struck you with blight and mildew, yet you didn't return to me. I sent among you a pestilence. I made the stench of your camp go up in your nostrils, yet you didn't return to me. I overthrew some of you, yet you didn't return to me, declares the Lord. Therefore, I'm going to do this. And here comes the judgment. Uh, we had five kids. We've got nine grandkids. Our kids are great parents and I, because of Becky. Um, they're just marvelous parents. But we determined early on the way we would discipline our children 
is do the least amount of discipline you need to to get the result. You know, don't throw a nuclear bomb on them if you can get the same thing with time out. You know, you don't, don't, you, 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 you start with the least amount of punishment necessary to get them in line. Sometimes you got to ratchet it up because they don't get in line. Sometimes with one of our daughters, if you looked at her like this, she's bawling and she will be different for the rest of her life. Another one of our daughters, you look at her like that, she'll look at you like that. <laughs> you, you hold up your finger, she'll hold up her finger. It's just different stuff with different kids. Well, God treats us like his children in that sense. And he tried all of these different things and they just wouldn't do it. I, look, a contemporary of Amos was Jonah. Go back to Jonah. You got God, you got Jonah. God says to Jonah, go east to Nineveh. Jonah goes west. God says to Jonah, go inland to Nineveh. Jonah says, I'm going to the sea. God says, go preach to the pagans. Jonah's on the boat. The pagans want to hear about God, and Jonah's just going to sleep. And I don't want to be that way. I don't want God to have to ratchet up the attention getters in my life. I want to be obedient the first time. Does that make sense? Okay, here are your points for home. God's going to speak over your life. Is it going to be for you or against you? You say, well, I'm not good enough for him to speak for you. That's okay. He spoke for you in Jesus. All you got to do is bring your sin to him. Confess who you are. Confess what you've done. And he will take care of the cancer. But at the end, what you got to do is you got to lean on him and not lean on yourself. And that can transform us because God will be at work in us. So we're out of time. I thank you for listening. Let me bless you in the name of Jesus. Have a great Thanksgiving, and I'll see you in two weeks. Uh, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I ask your blessings on all of us here. Father, I, we all can confess to you that we are sinners in need of your forgiveness, in need of your touch, in need of your strength. And we readily confess that, Lord. And we embrace your forgiveness in Christ and ask you to speak blessing over us, strength over us, give us wisdom, give us discretion, bless us in these holidays in a way where we can be a blessing to others by giving thanks to you publicly and privately for the transformation you've brought about in our lives. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys.